On this episode of Earth Focus, two cities, Freetown, Sierra Leone and San Francisco, California, continents apart, vastly different culturally and economically, yet facing the same struggle to adapt to rapid urbanization, all set against the backdrop of a dramatically changing climate. If when they come and not they able to sleep, because they think I say, what it be happening? I must, and they think about I must happen back. So that now we're afraid now, Naya. So this rain it come all day Sunday, throughout the night back Sunday, say they clean Monday. We auntie call me, say the boy, I hear news, but so say on a day and now, disaster don't take place there. Say come quick. Any side where you they say just left anything where you they padule you can. I hear a sound where they go and shake about two times. Make it three times now it explode. Explode will be gissy stone. The Red Cross says more than 600 people are now missing and that more than 200 have been killed after heavy rains caused a severe mudslide in the West African nation of Sierra Leone. To me, I'm believing, as I said, the ground is open. All the hoes then go inside, then wait till come on up, it can't in there. So I come, they not even reach down to we. We say we all stay outside on bed. I lived over there. I was living with my uncle, uh, a family of 12, but I left six months before it happened. When I came over, I said, no, 25 houses are missing. They've been covered, not even moved, but they are covered. And they say in Peking, where they breastfeed, the water name be go with her. So I begin walking back to the hospital there. You know, they, they, I won't come back. So they, they dig the body then. I know they will see her. So like they say, they all don't bury under the dirty. I lost over 50 members of my family as I'm speaking to you now. Over 50 of them. The sister all died, the man died. In Piki where they breastfeed, they died, they all died. Many times I think about this small slide, I refer it to the cry of Sierra Leone. When the war took place, there was a massive rural urban migration to Freetown. So when they came to the city, most of them found themselves or decided to find where the, the value of land is much lower. And these areas could be the hillside slums wherein they settled. Because the structure at the ministry was not that functional, they were unable to cope with the situation. So the people were building here, there, without even going through the due process. So that created a lot of chaos. What's happening? If you talk about the landslide, if you go back 10 years ago, that very area was part of the National Park. Really, people have no business to go and build there. No get problem, Because when I get problem, there was no infrastructure made in terms of road network or anything like that. That means everybody basically started digging into the hill and trying to get the rocks. That's what they use for concreting. So basically, we weakened the foundation of that slope, and it's been going on for a long time. And unfortunately, we had heavy rains that contributed. So it just all what you needed was a small fault somewhere, and it just cracked off. Deforestation is a huge problem. I mean, if you go to National Protected Area Authority, they will tell you that they are fighting it on a daily basis. 
forests play a huge role in terms of protecting our waterways, protecting the slopes. And if you start destroying that ecosystem around us, you're basically inviting problems like what happened with the landslide. Climate change is global. It's not necessarily, it even has to happen in Sierra Leone. What you're doing in the United States or England is coming to affect us. So it's a bigger thing, but everyone has a responsibility. For us, I think it's more about preventing some of these things. Like if you've got a slope, you've got a hill, don't destroy it because the weather patterns are changing. Maybe in August we got 30 inches of rain because of the climate change, and now we are getting maybe 300 inches. We have to caution in the way we are disrespecting our environment. If a lot of attention has been drawn to this particular uh, issue, that we are going to expect this, the occurrence of a mudslide, and that we are sitting on a powder keg if nothing is being done seriously to overcome this. So if all these warnings were there and not much was taken, I would consider that the recent mudslide is really not natural. It is to a large extent man-made. I mean, we all know that most cities across the developing world, we are grappling with all this urbanization of the poor. Urbanization is not going to go away, but that's why you have uh, institutions created to plan it. Urbanization is good if you are able to manage it very well. Cities contribute over 60, 70 percent of the GDP in most countries. Same applies to Freetown. Now the question is, are we in a position to manage it well? That's an open question. The stark reality is this, like we stopped planning for decades. I mean, if you look at Freetown, you look at the Central Business District, you see some resemblance of planning. You see the streets, you know, were planned, were structured. But after the 60s, 70s, we stopped. Why, I don't know. And so since then, planning has never been a national priority until recently. If we were to develop the city, looking at the geography or the topography of Freetown, you realize that it has a very small space of land that settlement or housing could be done. And if we were to do infrastructural development in the hillside areas, we would have put in certain mitigation measures in terms of the runoff. That was not done. Also, looking at the number of slum communities each year that are affected by floodwaters, we should have looked at what type of housing should have been established in this area. Inside this community is about 7,000 people where at least they suffer this uh, 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 flooding. Uh, uh, if you can see the demarcation of the water, and you saw the water be rich, and this water don't pour but cook go party for we. When the water, the flooding, when the cow don't then rubbish them, you go clear, tell you the tire. The, the remnants where they left now, now they mosquito, they can't breathe. Me, big one, I know they see this at green camp, but when they send us, they can't get from me, they couldn't cancel. Let me get that. If you toast it, they really tip a drink. Sometimes that's all they cause for letting them get this cholera, diarrhea. Over the 30 years old, don't dare, we don't ever experience flooding at this Congo Tong community. Ever. We see Canada trouble in the carries. From observations, living in Freetown and in Sierra Leone for several decades now, I'll say that the weather conditions have changed a lot. We used to have six months of rainy season, six months of dry season. Now the rainy season has been restricted to a couple of months, and within these restricted months, the intensity has increased intensively. The climate change now, just one hour or one hour, 30 minutes, rain and the flood. You worry, you worry. It don't happen 2015, 2016, and 2017. We don't know. So then 2018 will be the worst. We own preparation all. We they call upon government for giving a retaining wall. That now we own preparation because we poor. We poor. All people will be the live there. 
All things go backward now. Nah, school no day. Like I see them picking them no more now. Nah, so all man they are now. Work no day. So man I nah, be worker. Before green, I will left right now with me picking where I go with the morning. They will think to pick it the way we go all the day. They know you understand right now, see now where they are put there. And they ask me, I can say that mama don't go buy market. So we can never tell it. If we come here now, we go to a village, we go find who said a village, we go tell them, then they say understand. So now so. I have their pictures on my phone. When I watch them, I fall tears. I try hard as a young man to resist, but when resisting, they are persisting. And most of my family members, we are helping me educationally, financially, in terms of feeding. But being that I have lost all of them, sometimes even to get a daily meal, it's hard. What moved me really from my own village to the city is education. Because the school I was attending at my village, there is no light, there is no computer, there is no phone like for internet facility. Sometimes teachers that do come to the city when they explain to me, do you know about internet when I was in the village? You know, I was like a dreamer, asking what is internet, what is internet, when I don't even know about phone. If I come to the city, I get my education no matter what. Whatever resources I get here, I can go back to my village, you know, bring on board. Now, where this thing I don't be now, I'll be here with kind of story that I see. They be don't say, let no be under. They don't save. They be don't say under bad. Me, the told be said to let you say, me, I know where you what I will get in life, you don't see die, they go there. Where you don't see, say, and if I go there, they go die, they, they still go there. But now, now that one, they say, we because God don't kill. You don't get any option. You are supposed to safeguard your citizenry. That is why you have a government. My question to them is, why are you allowing people to go and settle down in these vulnerable areas? Why didn't you advise the people? It is not the Minister of Lands allowing them. Someone may build a house anywhere until he, he or she completes that house without the knowledge of the, the ministry. So by the time you realize you have a whole settlement in a particular area. I'm not saying it's not the responsibility of the government. It is, but fortunately, the government is not in that position to effectively monitor development control. I mean, those are the challenges. Mohamed Bangla, when a Minister of Information, he get here. Other gam, na Ministry of Lands, na government man. So if they be seller we come here, then they live there. If you see them there, they, the government are we are people out there they live here. That's true that you have these government officials being in those areas. Unfortunately, there's too much lawlessness within the, within this country. People don't have respect for the laws of Sierra Leone, so allows them to do whatever they want to do. There are clear rules, but what else do you expect if the elites who are supposed to be enforcing these rules are at the forefront of building in such places? You can't be surprised if you see the poor going to also grab a place. For me, it's very simple. Nobody can own a land here without a survey plan from the Ministry of Lands, right? So if the Ministry of Lands clearly says this is green belt, then I think it's very easy to stop it. Find the person who signed that permit. Get rid of him. Easy as that. We don't really need to go run after the little guys who are trying to encroach. These are poor people. They're desperate. They are marginalized, basically. This is where I think government needs to come in and implement these policies they have. If we don't stop it, I think what we saw it's just the beginning. I I'm very, very scared. There's more to come. I know this area very well. There are many areas that are even more vulnerable than the very place that collapsed. It's unfortunate that a lot of people had to die unnecessarily. I feel very much uncomfortable that in a modern world whereby 
Some of these things can be taken for granted by various other nations. We still continue to grapple with it. It's really unfortunate, it's really sad. While Freetown residents fight for accountability, in San Francisco, climate change isn't debated as much as it's mitigated. Billions of dollars are pouring into the Bay Area, but is tech-driven development prepared for a sea level that's rising? San Francisco is experiencing a tremendous building boom and has been for the last five years. We have UCSF Hospital, we have the Warriors coming, we have a bunch of new apartment buildings. You have corporate headquarters of Facebook, Google, Microsoft. We realize we live in such an amazing place with so much creativity and innovation. I'm excited when I see the young people in the tech industry all over town, all over the Bay Area, commuting back and forth. There's an energy here. In Mission Bay, everyone pretty much works in tech, working on the next startup. I'll do a coffee. Okay, thanks. I am considered a millennial. We kind of are free spirits and we don't believe so much in just full-time gigs. I work in social media marketing, so it's definitely a new industry. A lot of people don't quite understand it, but I run social for a living. The really cool thing about a job in social media or just tech is that you can work remotely. Coffee shops are free. Yes, San Francisco is really expensive. There is no other place like San Francisco where you're going to have access to the technology, to the communities, to just the people working in the industry. It's just one of a kind and it's totally worth it. I sold my car and um, I pretty much walk everywhere now and I got rid of a lot of stuff and I live in a very small apartment, but it's totally worth it just to have access to everything. I just learned about the sea level rising, and I didn't know about that before we moved here. Does it concern me? Yes, because I eventually want to buy property here and have a family here, but I didn't know about that, and I'm not too informed, so it's not something that I'm really too concerned about right now. I am scared now, though, <laughs> learning that that's a possibility. People under 40, living here in the Bay Area today are very, very likely to see unprecedented annual flooding around the Bay in their lifetimes. It's gonna be fantastic in a city that is so vital and known for its innovation that we're gonna be able to build this great venue here. A lot of these new buildings uh, by the end of the century, including the Golden State Warriors uh, new arena, you would have the ground floors at least potentially flooded or basement parking flooded. The Warriors arena is, is you know, contemplating maybe someday putting in floodgates so that their garages don't flood. Uh, they're thinking of raising pedestrian access so that it would be uh, out of the water. San Francisco itself, you know, built a seawall uh, in the late 1800s to protect itself uh, and this new land that had been created. You know, right now, San Francisco is looking at spending $5 billion to repair and reinforce that seawall for another century. The areas that have been the least developed historically are the marginal lands around 
the bay, some of which are salt flats, others are abandoned piers, and they're being rehabilitated because there's basically no place else in the Bay Area to build. And they're being built upon as quickly as possible by mostly mega corporations that are trying to maximize their, their value by building very expensive developments. To me, it feels like sort of climate denial light. We found in 2015 that about $21 billion worth of development was happening right in that coastal zone. There is a tremendous amount of money to be made to develop in those areas. By the year 2100, we found there's a threat that sea level rise could, on a really bad day, flood land all around the bay, exactly where most of the waterfront development is happening. And then they're going to have to figure out how to invest public dollars to protect what we're building right now. Mission Bay was once a bay. It was an inlet of the bay. It was marshy and brackish and kind of shallow. Mission Bay is finally getting built after many, many years of planning and agreements around infrastructure. There's some really important institutions that are there now, new commercial buildings as well. It's an area that is rapidly becoming a part of the urban fabric of San Francisco, where it really was once seen as like a strange and unoccupied place. But because we planned it in an era before we were thinking of sea level rise, it's also very low lying and it's one of the city's more vulnerable places to future sea level rise. The problem is that the land is so valuable because it's now land. Development companies couldn't not build there. There were billions of dollars in real estate to be had, but they built it in probably one of the worst places they could have. It was a bay in the past, and it most likely will be a bay in the future. We picked this part of the shoreline for a study around design concepts for future sea level rise because it's the lowest lying area on the eastern waterfront. It's the place that's gonna flood first. And so we thought it was the right place to spark a conversation around what are our design alternatives or choices that we can make in the future. At the mouth of Mission Creek near AT&T Park, we'll have a really beautiful public space that people might not even realize is designed for flood protection. Ideally, we would have uh, wetland habitat and parks and a place where people can access the bay. We want to have a lot of commercial activity in our city. We want more housing. We definitely need more affordable housing to solve some of the Bay Area's biggest challenges. But alongside that, we have to do something about future sea level rise. Ideally, we'll have a lot of people enjoying the waterfront, and during storm events, we'll have some kind of way of protecting people through some kind of barrier or just because we have shallowed the channel in some way that makes it no longer super threatening when there's a super high tide. The science is undeniable. Climate change is altering our planet, placing many of our communities at risk. We must prepare for a future that directly confronts these changes. The defendants are Chevron, Exxon, BP, Shell, and ConocoPhillips. These funds will be used to pay for seawalls and other infrastructure needed to deal with sea level rise. We have some real risk that's going to require some billions and billions of dollars of investment by San Francisco on infrastructure if we were going to stop a uh, catastrophic loss. So that's what we're looking at. A lot of our developments are occurring along the waterfront. Our lawsuit is a, a, a part of that. I want to have this abatement fund that has been created now to ensure that we can fund the infrastructure improvements that we're going to need to ensure that those developments go forward without the threat of sea level rise. Politics in San Francisco is funny. There are a lot of really enlightened views. On the other hand, it's probably not enough to prevent uh, the business community from making things even worse right on the waterfront. We're going to have to adapt. It's gonna take that creativity and energy and capital. The, the, the question of how do we balance that economic development the investment in protecting it with the needs of people and the environment 
is, is one that you know, we're going to find ourselves asking over and over again here in the Bay Area and around the world. Focus is made possible in part by the Orange County Community Foundation and the Farview Foundation.